Thank you so much, Jeff, and uh, good to see you all. Um, and thank you once again, Jeff, for uh, co-hosting this uh, series of webinars along with parliamentarians for the Global Goals and with the honorary president of the IPU, Gabriela Cuevas, who is also joining us today. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you for your introductory remarks. I think that uh, really um, frames the discussion that we uh, will have here today with parliamentarians joining us from all over the world. Um, we are, uh, for this first webinar in the series, um, focusing on, I guess, the issue that is on uh, top of mind of all parliamentarians, all decision makers in the world right now. Um, uh, of course, the pandemic and how to uh, deal with that politically, and uh, not least how to make sure that we leave no one behind um, along the lines of the principles of the 2030 agenda. This is, of course, a critical time for everyone, uh, you know, uh, either where you are in the world. The challenges may be different, but there are also similarities. And I think, Jeff, you just pointed out some of those things that should be uh, on the uh, list of all decision makers all over the world. So thank you for that. And um, just to briefly go through the program, um, we will now have uh, our panelists uh, give their presentations. Um, so we have allowed you eight minutes per uh, panelist. And I, I really encourage everyone to stick to that because we uh, have experience from the previous webinars that our um, participants are eager to also speak and to talk about their own experiences from their countries. So um, we will move in a minute uh, to the panel and then we will have for, for the last half of the webinar, a moderated discussion where we encourage everyone who is joining us today to speak about their experience and their, the current situation in their country uh, in relation to uh, dealing with the pandemic and leaving no one behind. And we encourage you also to share um, concrete uh, examples of uh, parliamentary action that you may um, pass on to your colleagues in the rest of the world who are joining us today. So we really hope for this to be a peer-to-peer -peer discussion um, amongst parliamentarians to share their um, experience and ideas. We will move now to the uh, panel, and it is my great pleasure to first uh, introduce uh, Peter Hortes, who is the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and a Professor of Pediatric and Molecular Biology and Microbiology at Gala College of Medicine. Um, and Peter is also co-chairing the Lancet COVID-19 Commission Task Force on COVID-19 Vaccines and Therapeutics, uh, the Lancet Commission where is chairing uh, uh, the commission. Um, so, Peter, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to have you with us today, and um, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Kirsten. It's an honor to be here, and it's always an honor to uh, be linked with uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, where I'm always inspired by his remarks. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview on the vaccine landscape uh, first. Uh, let me just briefly comment on where I think we're headed globally, uh, as well as in the United States. Um, the, the new uh, spike protein uh, mutants are clearly having a huge impact, and now we're actually learning why. It was, it's really quite extraordinary that a single uh, amino acid substitution in the, in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein going from an asparagine to an aromatic amino acid, a tyrosine, which is causing ring-ring interactions and tight binding, that's giving rise to uh, the major vari variants that give us greatest pause for concern, the ones coming out of the United Kingdom, the ones coming out of South Africa uh, and, and, and elsewhere. And uh, it's really uh, impressive how, uh, what a global disruptor, uh, a single uh, minor chemistry change can, can, can cause. And now the variants are, are spreading rapidly and the world is scrambling uh, on top of scrambling prior to this. Uh, with, with respect to vaccines, most of the current vaccines are expected to work against the UK variant, uh, but not in every case against the South African variant. And, and we'll talk about what that means. The biggest concern that I have is that there has been so much emphasis on innovation and, and, and focusing on the need to create innovative novel vaccines 
that the novelty came at the expense of having low cost, affordable and accessible uh, vaccines. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm, I'm concerned that the two mRNA vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer may not be scalable to the extent we need and will not have a major role in the world's low and middle income countries. Uh, the Merck uh, interesting live virus vaccines using VSV and measles backgrounds, they've dropped out. The Sanofi uh, vaccine is ex excessively delayed and it's not clear what role that's going to have, the same one for, for Queensland. And when you start moving down the list, you suddenly realize that there's not a lot out there really for the world's low and middle income countries. We have the uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine that's being made by the Serum Institute of India. We have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Potentially, it's not clear if the Novavax vaccine is going to be scalable to the extent that we need and produced at the scale that we need. So, so far we have the two adenovirus vaccines. Then we have uh, an inactivated vaccine from Bharat Biotech in Hyderabad and two or three recombinant protein vaccines. We have ours uh, prepared by uh, Biological E, BioE, and also in Hyderabad, uh, Medicago in Canada, and um, Clover, uh, which, which has a component in China. And then maybe some of the um, inactivated uh, virus vaccines also coming out of China, and then the Russian Gamalaya vaccine. And, and the, the issue with the Russian and the Chinese vaccines is they are currently not been released through what, what the WHO calls stringent regulatory authorities or through WHO pre-qualification. So there are some questions there. And as a consequence, we have very few uh, choices now available and not a lot of funding uh, to scale those up. So for instance, with our recombinant uh, protein uh, vaccine, which can now be made, it's now being made at 1.2 billion uh, doses by Biological E, you know, to get that launched, we had to build on our 10 year program of coronavirus vaccines. And it was quite interesting. I, you know, I found my, we found our group without any funds to uh, produce the yeast strain that needed to go to biological E. So we wound up having to raise, you know, a million dollars from a local distillery, Tito's Vodka, and a million dollars from um, a local foundation in Texas, and eventually put together $5 million from local donors in order to make that happen. So all of the talk about, you know, COVAX and, and CEPI and all of these financial instruments that were supposed to be in place, all kind of pushed very hard towards what I sometimes in my frustration call the shiny new toys, which, uh, which are unclear whether how much of that's really gonna filter to low and middle income countries. So that's something that really has to be discussed at a frank level, not in an accusatory way, but to uh, prepare for what's about to come, which are the, the spike protein uh, variants. As I said, I think all of the vaccines will work equally well against the UK variant, but I am concerned about the South African variant where we've seen so far that the AstraZeneca vaccine is not protecting against moderate uh, in, uh, infections against the South African variant. And that was one we were really counting on and maybe it'll have some protection against severe infection. We don't know that yet. But one of the big worries that I have with the South African variant, whereas so far Sub-Saharan Africa has done quite well uh, in terms of COVID-19 compared to other parts of the world, we think, although a lot of that may be due to underreporting as well. What's going to happen if the South African variant really accelerates and starts to cause levels of morbidity and mortality that we in Africa that we've seen elsewhere in the world, it's really unclear who's going to come in and, and provide uh, those vaccines or how maybe ours can boost uh, the South, the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine to produce one, one that will, will work. So despite all best intentioned efforts, we're still uh, somewhat bereft of opportunities uh, to vaccinate the world's low and middle income countries. And I think we, in moving forward, and we'll talk about this at this, the discussion, it's going to be very important to look at um, why we emphasize so much the, the, the major pharmaceutical companies and not enough the, uh, the group that calls themselves the developing country 
uh, vaccine manufacturers network, uh, which in the end of the day is providing that core support in order to make the vaccines the world, world needs. And so I think having a frank discussion about that would be extremely helpful. I think before I end, uh, another issue that I think we should also talk about is the fact that we do have a, a globalizing uh, anti-science uh, empire that uh, that really began out of Texas, uh, where I live and work, under this banner of health freedom or medical freedom, and quickly got tied to political extremism on the far right, where it was ultimately linked with QAnon and and added, tacked on not only an anti-vaccine movement, but also an anti-mask and anti-social distancing movement, which was then uh, uh, expanded to European capitals last year. And we saw uh, protests, anti-vaccine, anti-mask protests in Berlin, where there was an attempt to storm the Reichstag um, in Trafalgar Square in London and in Paris, uh, in Italy. And this has now become a full-on uh, anti-science uh, initiative or confederacy or empire, depending on the term you want to use. And so far, the uh, major uh, agencies have not really shown an appetite for confronting this in, in a substantive way beyond fine-tuning our message, amplifying our message, but not really taking down the empire. And then we have to deal with this very unpleasant uh, aspect, which includes it's being amplified a lot by the Russian government and, um, and a well-documented program of weaponized health communication that's been uh, highlighted by US and, and British intelligence. And, and this also is contributing to our problem with vaccinating the world. And we're going to have to have a frank uh, assessment and, and discussion about that. And then finally is the fact that um, even if we can work a way around these variants, we have to remember that coronaviruses are going to be here for a long time. We've had SARS in 2002, 2003. We've had MERS in 2012. And that's why we got involved with coronavirus vaccines, because we knew a third one was coming. And then right on cue, we've had COVID-19. And now we'll have the variants, which are acting very much like a, 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 almost like a new epidemic. And then on top of that, we should expect COVID-26 and COVID-32. So this is going to be a new reality for us. So I'll stop there and, uh, and hope that uh, we can have a, a lot of time for a productive discussion. So thank you, Jeff and Kirsten, again. Thank you so much, Peter, for um, your incredibly insightful uh, news and, and status of the vaccine situation and also the the worries there. Uh, Jeff, do you have a, a remark for this? Yes. Just to thank Peter. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Great, thank you so much, Peter. Um, so relevant to have this information for parliamentarians who are making decisions about this uh, in their countries right now. So um, uh, there is a, a question in the chat about translation. We are very fortunate today to have translation uh, to Spanish and English. Um, and this is thanks to uh, Speaker Cesar Letado from uh, the, so who is the president of the National Assembly of Ecuador. He sponsored this interpretation to Spanish today. So we're very grateful for that. Unfortunately, um, we don't have interpretation into other languages this time. Uh, we will be working on that for future webinars, but we're very grateful to be able to offer Spanish English translation today. Um, the next panelist, uh, I am very pleased to welcome uh, Ricardo Baptista Leite, who is a doctor by training and a member of the Portuguese parliament since 2011. And Ricardo is also the founder of UNITE, the global parliamentarians network to end HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis and other infectious diseases. Uh, it's a global platform of current and former policymakers uh, created under the auspices of UN AIDS and committed to ending these global health threats um, in accordance with uh, the sustainable development goals. And Ricardo, we're very pleased that you're with us today as well. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kirsten, and uh, thank you, Jeff, and also thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, because of you that uh, I'm also here. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be amongst uh, such bright uh, minds 
uh, being able to discuss these important issues that will inevitably, I think, um, condition our work as representatives of the people uh, in the years to come and to which we have a, a major obligation to respond uh, properly and accordingly uh, to what the people need. Um, I'm here on behalf of UNITE, which is a global network of parliamentarians, as was mentioned. We were founded in 2017, and uh, our network has always aimed to work on ending infectious disease as a global health threat. Well, three years ago, when we would speak to people uh, pitching the importance of pandemic preparedness and response, I can say the interest was a little bit less than we get today. And this means that there is an opportunity here for finally to achieve the kind of reform and change that we need, not only for pandemic preparedness and response, but also for approaching global health at large, which of course inevitably includes communicable diseases. Um, my, I personally uh, am a member of parliament here in Portugal and uh, trained in infectious diseases as a physician, actually having gone back since the beginning of the pandemic to the hospital and as a volunteer while maintaining my role at the university and in parliament. And I think that it has been extremely important to see the roles of parliamentarians of understanding their position at being at the interface between the people and uh, governmental power, making sure that the funding that is needed is secured, making sure that people's voice, especially those that are in most vulnerable situations, people that don't have a voice many times actually get heard because we know in times of crisis and pandemics or others, those that are in our most vulnerable situations, sadly, are many times left behind. And we've seen this over and over uh, throughout uh, global health history, having started very vividly with uh, HIV AIDS. But now with COVID-19, I think it becomes very clear to everyone that um, health safety and health security are prerequisites for economic growth and for global development. And this is something that governments need to understand around the world, because without, global, uh, without health safety and health security, we won't be able to achieve all of the other goals that we may be un, uh, aiming for. And what has become very clear also is that reactive health systems that had focused more on disease than on health and well-being of the people tend to fail, especially when put under a stress test. So, Picking up on what Jeff was saying, looking at the value for the money we're putting into health systems, we need to change the way we prepare and develop our health systems on the ground with the kind of reform that is needed to make sure that we are more focused on promoting healthy uh, populations, uh, healthy lifestyles, and preventing all the preventable diseases that are out there. Um, the truth is health and well-being of a population is like money in a bank. Uh, if you're well off, you really don't think about that money that much. But when a crisis hits, you're going to need it. And if you don't have a healthy population, if the well-being of your population is already substandard when the crisis hits, you will be hit the most. And that is what we are seeing also with COVID-19, sadly. Uh, the most vulnerable populations, once again, are the ones being left behind. And this leads to the discussion around global health. And what can we do about it? Well, uh, a friend of mine, Michael Weinstein, uh, many times says that um, if we were to uh, control and regulate uh, global health or, or air traffic control the way we do with global health, we would see a plane crash every five hours. And that's the truth. If given the current frameworks that we have in terms of global health, we are not prepared to deal with responding adequately in terms of cross-border biological threats. And uh, I'm just talking about responding. I'm not even speaking about preventing or even preparing for. And that means we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of discussion then, what can we do about it? And as parliamentarians, we have to take the forefront in that discussion. I personally feel that uh, we need to focus more on making sure that on the ground in each country, that we are capable of developing, developing the skill set and the institutions uh, bringing together not only health authorities, but also uh, other related authorities from defense and civil protection so that they can work together in terms of making sure that we do the proper simulations when we do not deal with a crisis or pandemic 
and that we are capable of responding when they do hit. But moreover, we need to have global coordinated control of all of the country's actions. And if we think of, about it from a military perspective in post World War II, that's in a way why in the North American and the North Atlantic region, we created NATO in the sense of making sure that we were capable of having uh, different countries prepared, but capable of working together and, and NATO for health, if you will. And such a response would be needed uh, at a global level, not just a regional level where every country could pitch in, making sure that we were capable of responding adequately, but sharing more information, being capable of detecting earlier a potential biological threats. I think it is consensual between, between all of us that uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic, as it has become, was avoidable if we, were a, if we had been able to early detect and contain this threat that uh, is undermining our social and economic well-being across the globe. So that being said, there is a role for everyone. Uh, it, it, there's a role for every parliament. Uh, well, the role of G20 and G7 countries and specifically can take a leading role. As was mentioned before, the IMF and the World Bank also have an important role. I'm the vice chair of the parliamentary network of the World Bank and IMF, where we are facing and dealing with these issues and trying to push these issues forward. But we need to do more. And working between UNITE and the parliamentary network of the World Bank and IMF, we're also pushing for COVAX to, to make sure that we get the additional billions that are missing in terms of funding. Because as was said, if we do not vaccinate the whole of the world, we will all be uh, left behind. But we also need to think in terms of research and innovation. We saw amazing advancements in terms of vaccine development. But the truth is, this crisis has also showed that we have not invested enough in terms of research and development, in terms of vaccine production and distribution. We need innovation in also these fields because that is a true bottleneck when it comes to uh, distributing uh, vaccines at a, at, a, at a price that is achievable for everybody across the globe in a timely manner, because time is of essence. If we do not vaccinate the world uh, sooner than what we are currently predicting, those variants that uh, uh, we just heard about will just continue to grow and, and will uh, ultimately undermine our efforts in terms of global vaccination. I'd like to end just by saying that there are many things that parliamentarians can do. These are some at the global multilateral level, but also at the local level, um, being capable when those parliamentarians have health advice uh, that they can be given uh, working through university or as myself as a volunteer, or in other fields like uh, Esther Pasaris, who is a, a parliamentarian from Kenya, the chair for, from uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, who is working to make sure that essential goods are being delivered where they are needed, including essential medicines for other infectious diseases to populations that have been isolated given the COVID uh, um, crisis and the, the, the problems that they're seeing on their supply chains. Or as uh, Senator Pia Cayetano in the Philippines, who is um, currently the chair at the Senate Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, and she's our chair for Asia Pacific. Or Andrew Ullmann, member of parliament in Germany, who is the vice chair of the Global Health Committee at the German Bundestag, who has been able to push for many important changes in their policy and rising budgetary, budgetary allocation for HIV or putting neglect of tropical disease on the agenda. At large, uh, and we have, of course, Gabriela Cuevas uh, in her current role now as co-chair of the UHC 2030. Parliamentarians are doing such an extraordinary uh, job on the ground, and we need to come together, especially to focus on the sustainable development goals. We have a decade to go, and I'm already hearing too many voices among governments and also parliamentarians saying it's not achievable anymore. This is something that we need to give up because given the COVID crisis, there's not enough money, there's not enough commitment, we're, we're focusing on other fronts. And what we as parliamentarians, especially us that have positions of leadership in multilateral organizations, we need to make our voice very clear. The SDGs now are more important than ever. They are the beacon that will lead us through this decade to come in terms of social and economic crises to make sure that we comply with exactly what we promised we to do in 2015, which is not to leave anyone behind. Now more than ever, this is, uh, I believe, a uh, truth that is, is one that we need to fight for. It is, it is our moral obligation to make sure that coming out of this crisis, we are capable of 
building back better, as many have said, of making sure that our health systems, our response systems, our, our prevention and preparedness uh, mechanisms towards pandemics are better off, but also our social and economic response learns from the mistakes of the past. It is a moral obligation. It is the challenge of our lives. And as parliamentarians, we have this unique opportunity to lead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Uh, that is so well put. Uh, and uh, thank you for your leadership uh, within health, within the SDGs, uh, in your country and globally. I think this is an example to be followed. And um, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful remarks. Um, we will now move to the next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Killian Kleinsmith, who uh, has over 25 years hands-on experience in international development, emergency response, resource mobilization, and has worked with a number of uh, organizations, countries, and, and programs. He is the founder and chairman of IPA, Innovation and Planning Agency, that uh, specializes in identifying resources globally and matching them with the needs of disadvantaged regions. And um, I guess this is exactly what we need at this uh, very critical time. So, um, Mr. Kleinsmith, we look very much forward to hearing your remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, well, what an opportunity to speak to all of you. I'm speaking to you from uh, Addis Ababa, where I arrived yesterday um, to look into ways forward of dealing exactly with those um, we don't wish to leave behind in all of this. I'm based in Tunisia, in Tunis, um, and um, also there involved in issues of migration management, um, also looking into disadvantaged regions in the country and trying to see of how they can become better connected. Um, but I can tell you, I'm, I'm pretty concerned. I'm very concerned because in the now, uh, by now uh, 30 years or so of working with populations in distress, populations in war, in crisis, disasters of all sorts, I have rarely seen, especially in countries which uh, I would say um, on, on a way upwards, um, uh, I have rarely seen such a disillusion of the small people, of the people who feel that they're left really behind, um, especially now. Um, unemployment rising, the informal sector, which has been the most hard hit in, in many places, um, totally disillusioned, um, not really seeing where the way it goes forward. This, this uh, afternoon, I visited actually um, a couple of small and medium enterprises here in Addis Ababa, talking to people. And, I mean, frankly speaking, um, nobody was wearing a mask. Uh, there was no social distancing. There was no concern as such about the pandemic as, other than saying, well, look, we need to work. We need to, we need to move forward. Um, we have contracts, luckily, again, after the first uh, plunge after the beginning of the pandemic. And now we need to work. So we can't, we can't waste time on other things in any way, some form of uh, statements were made of saying, well, we, we don't die as much as you Europeans who die of, of the pandemic. Um, a few days ago, I was in southern Tunisia in one of the most uh, disadvantaged regions of the country, uh, um, pretty, pretty dire in the sense of uh, everybody is wanting to get out, um, and even more so now. And there's really, um, besides the sort of exacerbation of um, what has been a problem already before, um, we're seeing really um, that people don't hear anything. And then I will be very critical and very direct here, don't hear anything of their leadership, which is really giving them answers. Um, talking to a man who um, actually attended one of the demonstrations um, um, linked to the anniversary of the revolution in Tunisia. He said, well, we were promised um, a meager 50, 60 euros um, a year ago in, in direct aid uh, for the people in the pandemic. We, we haven't seen it. We haven't heard about this anymore. So that's why we're here demonstrating. We don't believe in our leadership anymore. We don't believe in a, in, in a parliament, and I will be also here um, just uh, reporting what, what the man told me. We don't believe in a parliament which is more busy with itself than with the real issues of the people. 
So uh, what I want to come to is, is, is um, that we, we seem to see um, a very, very deep divide in a number of countries who, where, where people can't even afford the test because it's simply too expensive for a, a worker who's um, earning um, even less than the test costs per month. Um, we, we are really seeing here this divide between those people who, and that's the majority of the populations um, who don't see any, any way forward other than eventually moving on, moving out, moving away, or taking even other measures. So this is for me um, the moment where crisis must become opportunity. That's a, a moment where parliaments, where leaders need to come together and forget for some time about the issues which may be uh, coalitions and compositions of governments. This is about giving very clear messages. Communicating much clearer is an issue. Trying to, to be very open about what is the way forward, developing visions, developing very clear plans. That is not something we, we hear frequently. And um, that I think is the, is the biggest, uh, would be the biggest point. It's not, people say we can survive, we can continue to survive, but please tell us where this journey is going. And of course, that is linked to the bigger game. Where's the money coming from? Where are the uh, resources coming from? Where's the access to vaccines? I and mean, we even, um, in the env environment I've been in, well, today and um, also um, a few days ago in, in Tunisia, people don't even think about vaccinations. It's, it's, it's so far away from, from them, but they want to hear that there will be a way forward. So clear communication, um, a clear um, um, a clear getting together of the political leadership, and that includes you, the parliamentarians, of saying, well, this is a crisis. It's as, as serious as our other challenges linked to, to climate change, our other challenges um, um, linked to um, a, a need to reshape our economy. Um, but here we are together, and you, the people, you are the number one. And then I think... Um, this voice, the voices of, of those small people need to be heard and listened to, need to, pro need to be promoted. Um, and therefore, that is actually really my appeal. Please do um, give these messages to people because otherwise I, I don't know where we're going. Um, they don't know where they're going and they're ready. Um, many are ready, unfortunately, to move on, move away, and don't believe in, um, in the state as such any longer. Um, with these words, um, uh, I thank you very much. And again, um, please do listen to the voices of the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kleinsmith. And from that report from the ground, and I think you point to something extremely important uh, in these critical times that something larger is at stake here as well, that the trust and the or the lack of trust in uh, decision makers and in, in representatives. And I think Ricardo also pointed to this moment as, um, as an opportunity to reconnect really with your constituents and, um, and be that voice or channel for them to, to make their voices heard. So thank you very much for that, Mr. Kleinsmith. Um, and um, we will then move to uh, our last panelist, who is Ms. Gabriela Cuevas, who, apart from being one of the co-organizers of this webinar series and uh, the honorary president of the IPU, member of the Mexican parliament, is also, um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, and the newly elected uh, co-chair of the UHC 2030 steering committee. And the UHC is uh, 2030 as a multi-stakeholder platform on health systems strengthening. Uh, Gabriela, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Thank you, Jeff, for uh, having these webinars again. I think this is an amazing opportunity for parliamentarians to get engaged into the SDGs, but also to have uh, very important inputs and ideas on how to make change happen. We are always uh, reading and ratifying international instruments, but then, as uh, Kilian was mentioning, and also Ricardo, then we have to go back to our constituencies. We have to rebuild trust. We have to come back with solutions. So this time I would like to speak uh, perhaps with too many capacities, but I would like to mention 
three very important documents. Uh, the first one, of course, are the SDGs, the 2030 Agenda. That's the most important commitment for the world to change. But also we have two very important documents. Uh, one is the UHC 2030 State of Commitment and the Country Profiles. I'm going to explain the, this document. And of course, the Lancet COVID-19 Commission, the statement that uh, Jeff just released, uh, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, that points uh, very well which are the priorities for 2021. Uh, Perhaps we can uh, post the, the link in the group chat because I think that's also a very interesting document that can be very helpful for parliamentarians because there are many important ideas that we can translate through this international perspective into local solutions. And I will go directly to UHC 2030. In September 2019, at the United Nations high-level meeting, universal health coverage moving together to build a healthier world, world leaders endorsed the most ambitious and comprehensive political declaration on health in history. And we did the same at the IPU in October the same year. In endorsing those declarations, the, the world recommended to ensure that by 2030, everyone in every country can receive all the quality health services they need without suffering financial hardship. In assessing the state of UHC commitment at the global and country levels, UHC 2030 has identified eight commitment areas and assesses against these specific commitments areas to hold leaders to account. The first synthesis was published in December last year together with 193 country profiles. You can find everything at the UHC 2030 website. Findings show that in many countries, poor and vulnerable groups are being further left behind and inequities are widening due to the COVID-19 crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic is also exposing and exacerbating weaknesses in health systems showing that many governments neglected to invest in health, social safety, safety nets, and many governments neglected uh, also to work for emergency preparedness when it really mattered, before a crisis struck. Even countries with stronger health systems could have been better prepared for this emergency or whatever, whatever other emergency, because this is not going to be the, the, the only one. This is, there is still much uh, to be done to ensure adequate support to frontline health workers, to meaningfully engage all stakeholders in decision making, and to ensure gender equitable responses. Furthermore, many countries have not adopted measurable national targets and public awareness of government's commitments remains limited. We have eight uh, commitments uh, at uh, UHC 2030. The first one is to ensure political leadership beyond the health. We were talking about trust. Well, this is why political leadership is really needed. To commit to achieve UHC for healthy lives and well-being for all at all stages as a, a social contract. The second one, leave no one behind. That's why we are here. Third one, our job description, legislate and regulate. Four, uphold the quality of care. Five, invest more, invest better. Six, move together. And of course, gender equality and emergency preparedness. I would like to uh, go a little bit deeper to the ones that are part of our job description. Regulate and legislate. Expand and strengthen UHC legislation and regulations set clear targets and communicate better to bring people together. I will use some of the examples that I have seen uh, as a IPU president some months ago, but also now at uh, UHC 2030. Some countries are not doing anything, to be honest, in terms of, of giving really health for all. But some others are having health as a human right in the best constitutions, but without a national plan or without a real strategy. So many countries have not adopted measurable national UHC targets and public awareness of government commitment to UHC remains limited. 
One of the key findings for the 2030, 2020 UHC survey is that stakeholders are unclear about what constitutes a UHC commitment and what, if any, commitments their governments have made recently or in the past. In referring to commitments, survey respondents often mentioned references to health in their country's constitutions or laws or big policies or statements made in meetings or in the media. For example, well, classics, uh, political narrative. If we are not able to translate political narrative into actions, we are only making a, a, a trust more uh, damage. So, we really need to explain and to be very explicit on which are the UHC targets to increase coverage of essential health services or to increase financial protection or have faith to communicate. To, we need to communicate those targets to stakeholder groups, including, of course, civil society organizations. We also need to define uh, uh, how are we going to monitor progress towards UHC. As parliamentarians, we need to legislate. We need to be very clear on the uh, concept as a basic human right, but also we need to go to the secondary legislation and to go further which are the most important uh, policies that are going to be mandated in the legislation. And of course, that goes to two very important issues, uh, budget allocation and oversight. And if we are not defining how are we going to monitor progress towards the UHC, we are going to be completely lost. But in the, in the 2030 agenda, the SDGs are showing very clear indicators. We have 3.8.1, coverage of essential services, and 3.8.2, financial protection. Uh, when we go to the other objective that I was mentioning uh, for UHC 2030, there is invest more, invest better. Invest in public health and primary health care as a joint effort of health and finance ministers and local governments to ensure the continuity of essential health services and provide first line defense against outbreaks. People want more government spending on health, but tend to overlook public health and preparedness, which are essential public goods. If we go to how governments are spending, well, for most of them, the most important uh, uh, allocation in budget goes to military and to the army. Well, uh, this pandemic is showing us that one of the most important enemies is a virus, and we were not prepared for that. So this is the moment to take a look and to question ourselves on how are we going to allocate our budget. In Mexico, we have a say. True love is only shown in budget. Otherwise, it's only political blah, blah, blah. And the third one that I would like to, to point out among the eight commitments is moving together, build partnerships through genuine civil society engagement. We are always complaining about how citizens are not part of politics and they are not getting involved. But there's, a, um, I think, a, a very important side of that. And it's how politicians, how parliamentarians are open or not for civil society and to be questioned and involved with uh, uh, organizations and citizens. So we need to understand that the real change in terms of universal health coverage needs to involve everyone. We are having, for example, at UHC, uh, the private companies, we have civil society organizations, we are getting closer to parliamentarians. Of course, we work with governments. We understand that this is teamwork. This, this universal health coverage needs all of us. To be very clear, if we do not make a significant change in access to health, five billion people are going to be left behind by 2030. Five billion people are not going to have access to health or medication. So we need you guys, we need parliamentarians to make a significant change. And again, 
please take a look to the UHC 2030 state of commitment and the country profiles. The country profiles could be very useful for you. And the Lancet COVID-19 Commission, the statement that uh, uh, we published just yesterday, the priorities for 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gabriela, and also for your um, very precise recommendations on how to begin the monitoring and, and the parliamentary oversight of the commitments that have already been made by uh, many governments around the world. So a very important um, point there. Thank you so much. And thank you also for your leadership uh, in the universal healthcare movement, Gabriela.